Thank you very much, uh, Donald. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, there's no audience more intimidating than one's predecessors. <laughs> and there are several of my predecessors uh, in the room. So that's another good reason to be short. But thank you so much for asking me to, to be a part of this uh, conference. Um, I suppose my presence here is an illustration of the difference between politics and history. <laughs> because some people are sometimes surprised to discover that it's not actually part of the British ambassador to Egypt's job to defend the actions of his forefathers. <laughs> and I certainly don't think it's part of my job to try and defend what Britain did uh, in Egypt 100 years ago. What I do think uh, very strongly is part of my job uh, is to encourage uh, the serious study of Britain and Egypt's shared history. Uh, and that is why I was absolutely delighted to discover that this, pro this uh, conference was in preparation. And I'm delighted that it's turning out to be the fascinating and important event that it's turning out to be. Because I do think that um, we should be talking in an open and friendly way about our uh, shared history. And that's exactly what's going on today. Now, um, obviously, the session Britain and Egypt... Um, uh, was the one I, I was hoping to be able to take part in because it's, uh, I live that subject uh, 24 hours a day. Um, we've heard that uh, Richard Long can't be with us, but uh, Peter Mackenzie-Smith, and I'm delighted that Peter, incidentally, is getting a, a speaking role since he played such a, a, a major part in the organisation of this conference. Uh, Peter's going to read out uh, his text. But I'm delighted to introduce now uh, Professor James Whidden, from the History Department at Acadia University in Canada. Again, like one of my predecessors, I won't go through his distinguished CV because it's in the papers that you will have in front of you. But I would only just say that I can think of no one better qualified to talk about Britain and Egypt during this period uh, than Professor Whitten. Uh, he's going to talk about the British and 1919 reaction, reform, and regime restoration. And I think, amongst other things, he wins the alliteration prize <laughs> Uh, for this conference, and perhaps every other conference. So, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Whitten. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is, this is about British responses, and particularly it's about British official responses. So the paper's based upon a foreign office um, files and um, cabinet papers, which suggests that the British in 1919 could only envisage Egypt's future within a British legal geography or within a British constitutional framework. And that, by that I mean either staying in the empire or dominion status, or within the commonwealth, or finally, as it was worked out, um, a constitutional monarchy. But a constitutional monarchy very much in the British mold. This is the way, so I'm trying to get to how the British uh, understood how they could respond to uh, the revolution. And secondly, I should just say, uh, by regime restoration, uh, what I mean to say is that the revolutionary government of the WAFT was replaced in 1924 by a palace administration. And so the, you know, the revolutionary government of the WAFT was the manifestation of the revolution. That didn't really happen until 1924, and it lasted even less, uh, less it, was, it stayed in power less, for less time than even the Morsi government, if we look at the sort of the fruit of the revolution as um, a constitution and elections and the coming to power of a, of a new. Uh, regime. So we go backwards in, in 1924 with the coming of the um, uh, a, a monarchist group controlling power. Nevertheless, the, the revolution provoked intense debates amongst British officials in London and Cairo, and the distinction between the officials in London and Cairo I think is significant, on the issue of the extension of British, British liberties. And again, that's the way they saw it, um, civil and political rights to the Egyptians. Liberal imperialists or reformist British policymakers imagined Egypt following a path already laid out in colonial locations like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa. 
uh, where self-governing autonomy had already been attained. However, the electorate in all those examples was pretty much restricted to people of British descent. Um, so, and, but nevertheless, that's the positive reading of the application of British liberties uh, overseas, this idea that you could somehow uh, fit into the uh, dominion status or commonwealth. Uh, there's also a negative reading of this application, actually, of liberal principle uh, overseas. Uh, and that was typical of British colonies in Egypt, in India, and in Ireland. Uh, the, and those were the hot spots in 1919, of course, uh, where it was argued that concessions to nationalists would not lead to liberty, but to tyranny. Uh, this negative application of liberal principle is evident in the initial reaction in 1919, that is the British reaction, which was to dismiss the revolution as an anarchic expression of religious and racial intolerance manipulated by an irresponsible national leadership. And irresponsible because they were unrepresentative. That's basically the argument the officials were making. And this was an old colonial doctrine readily available to deny the extension of liberal reform to Egypt, which is to say self-governing institutions. Uh, the doctrine was based on the theory of an imperial duty to protect the fellahin, um, uh, the rural population of farmers, a population that the British had always imagined as segmented into regional, village, tribal, or religious communities, exploited by the elite. Uh, so this, um, this is from a satirical journal in Egypt, and it uh, satirizes the artificial character of the political activist, the Effendi. This is just a term they normally apply to the, um, the, the political class, except for the very top elite groups, suggesting that the language of nationalism was meaningless to the common Egyptian, the Fellahin, uh, a group, as this suggests, um, steeped in religious culture. Uh, the British applied the language of the French Revolution to the situation, describing the revolutionaries as Jacobin, formerly Girondist, a critique of Egyptian nationalists introduced by Lord Cromer. In this reading of events, moderate or liberal nationalism following constitutional precepts had been superseded by revolutionary terror. The WAF represented the sort of radicalism associated with the pre-war Watani party, which British uh, analysis viewed as the origin or inspiration of political actives, activists who were described as like idle cafe dwellers, members of underground uh, cells, parties, in short, the misguided effendi. Uh, British reports decoded the revolutionary political language, this is all in the FO files, uh, in 1919 as evidence that the revolutionaries rejected political compromise, pluralism, religious freedom, and freedom of expression. Uh, for instance, uh, um, observers were quick to identify revolutionary language, such as the phrase sacred union, it's a had mukaddas, or as we see here, patriotism is our religion, um, with, with French republicanism, uh, evoking all the excesses of the French Revolution, which is quite typical of British conservative thinking, of course. Uh, the, the French Revolution has that symbolic um, Meaning. Also, so called Orientalist interpretations were overlaid onto the radical revolutionary threat to liberty. Uh, British observers carefully recorded that the sacred qualities of the cause, the national cause, were used to castigate the moderates, those ministers willing to accept office after March 1919. So the moderates. Um, Adliyakan, et cetera, Rushdi, um, were, descri were described as dissidents or infidels. Thus, the revolutionaries did not represent political principle, according to the British, uh, or political community or polity, as we heard earlier today, only the intolerance of a, re of a religious collective. The revolution was inspired by tales of heroes and martyrs from Islamic history, where the motives for political action were honor and shame. This analysis demonstrated for the British official that the revolutionaries could not play by constitutional rules, 
Conservative imperialists took all this to prove that the revolution was a millenarian movement typical of Oriental societies, capitalized on by the Effendi, the national leadership. Those educated in modern theories of national politics, but not fully removed from traditional cultures. Uh, as Lord Curzon, and of course Curzon was the foreign secretary at, at this moment, uh, as Curzon reported to the House of Lords on 24th of March 1919, peasant revolts targeted communications, he means here telegraphs, railway lines, uh, and this is a quote, with a system and method that seemed to indicate a carefully planned organization. And he went on to, to paraphrase him, tenants had, tenants had risen against landlords. The Bedouin, uh, as he said, lawless element, uh, plundered. But these acts followed a plan that showed the hand of the Effendi organizer. Uh, Curzon condemned the revolutionary, and he called it a movement uh, for its disorder, violence, and unwillingness to compromise, appraising instead the moderates. Uh, when Edmund Allenby arrived in Cairo the following day, so that's on the 25th of March, he endorsed what he called the party of order. Uh, the Milner mission, uh, of course, Lord Milner, who was a colonial secretary, was sent out to investigate, as we've heard already. From late 1919, offered concessions designed to appeal to these moderates, eventually advising the end of the protectorate and the formation of a self-governing Egypt, Egyptian authority under a constitutional monarchy. To extend liberal principle to Egypt, to the Falahin, who again, we're going to get the vote. <laughs> when they say Falahin, they really mean more than 90% of the population, of course. Um, as Milner proposed to do this, to extend the franchise to the Falahin, was a major shift in imperial thinking and therefore shocked conservative opinion, which was led by uh, Winston Churchill at this time. Uh, liberal imperial reform, so to move from reaction to reform, uh, liberal imperial reform came to appreciate that the base of the revolution was not essentially religious, but national, that its organization was not primordial, uh, one of family, clan, sect, or class, but associational, one of institutional and professional associations intersecting with family, clan, and religious groups. Liberal imperialists, campaign for a constitutional reform in Egypt from early 1920 in anticipation of the Milner Report. So for example, Valentine Scherol in the Times asked if it was the intention of the government to repeat the, as he said, fatal blunder of the veiled protectorate, which of course is a reference to pre-protectorate pre, um, pre actually, before 1914, uh, to repeat the fatal blunder of the veiled protectorate when Gorst and Kitchener chose to placate the ex hadith at the cost of the support of the, quote, best elements of the Nationalist Party. From late 1920, liberal imperialists represented the Milner Report in this light as an extension of the principles of British liberty against the powers of an oriental despot, a principle shared with liberal nationalists in Egypt. Uh, the argument was strongly advanced by British officials in Egypt. So again, a lot of this sort of argument, um, this call for reform, does emanate from the actual man on the spot, as they like to say in imperial studies. Um, liberal reform came to appreciate uh, the base of, of the revolution was not essentially re religious. Um, in, for instance, an alternative reading of this relief, um, which of course depicts Zaglul entreating, this is from November 1918, right? This is from the uh, Zaglul monument in Alexandria. Entreating, in this case, it's Reginald Wingate, who's the high commissioner at that time. Of course, you see the royal soldiers uh, in the background. So, I mean, there's, there's an obvious resonance this has from the nationalist perspective. Here's the British army and the sort of proconsul on his throne resisting this entreaty uh, to, for representation at Versailles. The alternative reading, which I think um, Dr. Long would have spoken to if he were here today, um, was that the High Commissioner Wingate was willing to entertain the demands of the nationalists, um, which, to his credit, gave those demands legitimacy, but also led the British cabinet to dismiss him 
from his post as High Commissioner. So again, you see these two kind of tracks with, amongst the British officials, some willing to make concessions and others not. In 1921 and 1922, the argument for concessions was led by advisors to the Egyptian ministries. And of course, it was the British officials who acted as advisors to the various ministries. One of these, Morris Amos, a legal expert, um, reported that the British government should s support a policy of concessions as out outlined in the Milner Report. Amos rejected the colonial doctrine of a society divided between rural majority, and he used the term Fahim, and educated minority, the Effendi, uh, by arguing that Egypt was divided only by opinion. Firstly, there was the moderate party of the, as he said, educated and older members of the professions. Secondly, the Revolutionary Party consisting of students at religious and state schools. And it's significant that he points to both these groups, right? Both the sort of like, if you like, traditional and sort of modernized sectors of society coming together. Sheikhs and defendees coming together. Students, again, students are a key thing here. Students coming from both the religious schools and from the modern professional schools, particularly the law school was one of the most important uh, focal points of revolutionary activity from the first day. Um, this illustration uh, depicts the combination of Effendi and Falahi in the Waf party, if you like, with Zaglo here uh, pictured educating the you know, uneducated uh, Falahi in the principles of constitutional politics. It, again, it's satirical. Um, but nevertheless, it does show that combination within the Waft Party. Uh, Egypt, in other words, Egypt formed one political society with the Effendi, its leaders. This is a riposte to the conservative, the reactionary kind of description, right? Um, as Amos argued in his memoranda to the Foreign Office, the educated classes had various means to shape public opinion, and even if influenced by European languages and cultures, translated these ideas into local idioms through the mediums that represent represented the old and new types of political practice. A religious, or millenarian, is often the kind of the way it's depicted, a millenarian movement, as well as political party ideology. Rather than isolated communities of village, quarter, clan, and sect, Amos suggested that networks of press and telegraph, mosque and cafe, uh, enabled the building of informed political constituencies. Uh, nationalism was not a foreign intrusion, indecipherable to the average person, but rather was current and posed a real threat to those groups in Egypt or Britain, unable to respond and speak that language. <clears throat> Amos enveloped Egyptian nationalism within British legal geography uh, by asserting the legitimacy of the nationalist, of the nationalist leadership and its uh, constitutional demands. Uh, the, that the revolutionaries were representative of Egyptian national opinion demanded constitutional reform, comparable to reform in the settler colonies. Uh, by highlighting politics, that is contesting groups or parties, rather than social or cultural essentials, you know, Effendi, Sheikh, Falahin, Bedouin, uh, his analysis uh, marked a major break with the old colonial doctrine. This liberal policy had, however, to be forced upon a reluctant cabinet, and it was, and Allenby, again, to his credit, kind of was, was instrumental in forcing this change in policy through. Um, so after much persuasion from Amos, backed up by Allenby, a reluctant cabinet made the unilateral declaration of Egyptian independence, 22nd of February, 1922. So what, where we're at now is you've had this sort of liberal turn in terms of uh, British policy. And, and then, so how do you get from that liberal turn to regime restoration? That's just how I'm going to finish up here. Um, by 1922, it seemed the revolution had inaugurated a liberal era. Uh, indeed, one result of the 1919 revolution was to strengthen the hand of the Egyptian liberals. And we've heard earlier today about the liberal elite, right? So it strengthened the hand of the Egyptian liberals against the ruling family, so, so the Muhammad Ali dynasty, right, which had been there for over 100 years in power. Uh, the liberals bid to change the balance of political forces in Egypt through constitutional reform meant that the king harassed them from 1922. Uh, the, um, the, you know, Khadif Sultan uh, became king in, with, a, with a unilateral declaration in 1922. The king harassed the liberals 
from 1922, using techniques, modern techniques, such as oppressed campaigns that malign the liberals as colonial agents and enemies of the nation. So again, he's adopting nationalist kind of language. The Waft similarly, so at the same time, harassed the liberals in the press, in the nationalist press, and by other means as well. Um, the liberal government challenge from the right and the left fell in late 1922, uh, replaced eventually by a royalist cabinet. Um, um, also, the Constitutional Commission, uh, so a commission was formed to write the Constitution in 1922, which again, the, uh, the, the new Constitution was published in 1923. So this commission then became another battleground between liberals and monarchists. So it's important to remember that the revolutionaries, I mean, I mean the WAFT, uh, did, not did not participate in this commission. Um, so sitting on it, uh, the, the revolutionaries were excluded. Uh, they boycotted it, in essence, indicating that the British government, however, sought, to, sought a reformed administration. Its agents there on the ground in Egypt helped the liberals check the monarchists on the commission and establish the sovereignty of parliament in the constitution. The strengthening of the liberal position with British support meant that the monarchists worked parallel to the Waft Party to destroy the Liberal Constitutional Party in the 1923 elections. So the, the Liberals formed as an actual party, the Liberal Constitutional Party, and th those were the main two parties that contested the first elections, Liberal Constitutionals and the Waft. Um, they, okay, sorry, the Liberal Constitutions were re regarded by the Waft as the greatest threat to the revolution. They had British support. They represented some of the most powerful families with a long history of state service and control over provincial fiefdoms. Uh, the ruling family also regarded the liberals as a threat to its powers. As I've already said, you know, um, the liberals wanted to limit the powers of the king. The, uh, so what you have there, therefore, in effect, is an alliance between, an unofficial, undeclared alliance between the revolutionaries and the monarchy against the liberals. Um, the WAF defeated the liberal constitutions in the 1923 elections. It was a surprising result for the British. Indeed, between 1923 and late 1924, the British seemed at an impasse com committed to a liberal order that unexpectedly delivered a revolutionary government. Uh, it was the emergence of the monarchy as an openly political organization contesting a parliamentary party for control over the parliament that opened the way for regime restoration. The king took center stage at the opening of the elected parliament in 1924. Uh, the monarchists, and basically you do have a royalist party emerging by this point, so the monarchists, the followers of the king, found various means to challenge the Waft government. Uh, the king uh, forced Zaglou, which you see here, the king forced Zaglou to read the speech from the throne that recognized, in effect, the autonomy of the Sudan, the separation of the Sudan from, from Egypt. It's just rhetorical at this moment, but the nationalists don't want things to go in that direction. The king rejected civilian oversight of his appointments to ministries and religious institutions. And this was unconstitutional. So the constitution it was premised on the idea that there'd be civilian oversight for all these kinds of things. So already the constitution starting to break down. Um, uh, the royalist funded press savaged uh, the WAF's negotiations with the British in 1924. These are treaty negotiations. Um, and monarchist rallies confronted revolutionary demonstrations in the streets. But the turning point was the assassination of Sir Lee Stack, the military chief, the Sadar, in the Sudan, so he's the, he's the military officer, the, lead, the top military officer, British officer in, in the Sudan, and this happened in November of 1924. Uh, the British blamed the Waft in a series of reports, again, so this is all documented, Foreign Office Files, the British, um, the British agents uh, blamed the Waft for this, for this assassination in a series of reports that documented the violent revolutionary language of the Effendi, leadership in the run-up to the assassination. The assassins were also described in the press, both here in London and, and in Cairo, as Effendis. So Effendi is basically co code for a kind of radical revolutionary, <laughs> a sort of untrustworthy political um, agent. Uh, in, a, in other words, the, uh, the, uh, the British observers, for British observers, con constitutional reform gave way to revolutionary terror 
uh, a more thorough investigation over the subsequent years indicated that the assassins were close to monarchist agents, not loftists. So in other words, it's more, it's more likely that the monarchists assassinated Stack than the nationalists did. Uh, nevertheless, the WAF government fell in late 1924, forced out by Allenby, who switched, to, switched changed his tack then. Um, and it was succeeded by a royalist cabinet, uh, with a few of the less prominent liberals sitting in that cabinet. Most liberals refused to join the, um, the, par the, the uh, palace administration. Uh, the king dominated the political arena for the next 10 years. You have the coincidence of the appointment of the arch-imperialist Lord Lloyd at the same time as you have a conservative com government coming to power here. So um, that kind of cemented <laughs> what I'm going to call regime restoration. Because as I see it, the liberal order, the system's still there. It's largely uh, broken down. And you're going something really back to pre-1914, where you have the fiction of Egyptian autonomy and independence, but in reality, you have some sort of colonial administration. So just to conclude, conservative imperialists seized the opportunity to stall the revolutionary bid for complete independence, and as it turned out, limited the scope of liberal reform. The case to include Egypt within the orbit of a reformed empire, as initiated in the settler colonies, was maligned according to the old doctrine that each Egyptian self-rule amounted to misrule. Uh, the authoritarian elements in Egypt, and there were lots of those, uh, uh, lined up behind the king. That result was welcomed by conserv conservative imperialists here, uh, but lamented by British liberals, uh, particularly a lot of these colonial agents. Uh, and really, an entire colonial administration was disbanded in 1925 and forced into other posts. All those uh, colonial agents who had argued for reform were moved away, and Lord Lloyd uh, adopted a very obstructionist kind of policy in his relationship with the WAFT. So, so I mean, to conclude, uh, uh, arguably, the British did not determine this outcome, but maneuvered to manage a complicated political party contest in Egypt, a contest that was won by the monarchists. Thank you. So no very fixed ideas, the Foreign Office, the High Commissioners, and the Egyptian Nationalists. After the British occupation in 1982, 1882, <laughs> Egyptian nationalism was encouraged to one extent or another by the UK's agents and consuls general, commonly known as residents. Sir Evelyn Baring, who became Lord Cromer, included Saad Zaglul in the cabinet from 1906 to 1912. Sir Eldon Gorst gave backing to the nationalists until he lost support at home and, in a manner habitual in the next two decades, was replaced. Lord Kitchener fostered the emergence of the nationalist leaders of 1918. His five successors were removed from their posts by the governments that sent them. All were handicapped by statements about independence, incautiously voiced, by leading British officials after Istanbul's 1914 declaration of war. General Maxwell, the army commander, promised that Egypt, still theoretically ruled by an Ottoman viceroy, the Khedive, would attain self-government at the peace. Wingate told Prime Minister Hussein Rushdie Pasha that the question of independence will be considered then, and Oriental Secretary Ronald Storrs spoke in identical terms to Rushdie, who consequently expected that it would be discussed immediately after the armistice. When Istanbul decided to ally with Germany in the war, Egypt had become a protectorate. Khedive Abbas Hilmi was deposed and replaced with the title of Sultan by Hussein Kamil. And Sir Henry McMahon, accredited in January 1915, was named High Commissioner. Responsible for the politics of the Arab, Arab revolt, his relations with Hussein Kamal were poor, and the Sultan claimed that for over a year he had no contact with the residents. McMahon was summarily dismissed when Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey espied a dream substitute. This was Sir Reginald Wingate, who for 17 years had been Governor General of the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan 
and Sirdar over the Egyptian army, 65% of whose strength was based in the Sudan. Wingate had not visited Egypt for two years, and within a, within a week of his move, most of those who had urged his transfer realized that it had been a mistake. He labored under multiple hindrances. The greatest was a complete absence of guidance from London as to its Egyptian policy. C.S. Jarvis, a British official with long experience in Libya and Egypt, wrote that the Foreign Office never had any very fixed ideas on the subject. And Valentine Chirol, foreign editor of the Times, believed that the British government had never had an Egypt policy and was too busy to conceive one. If true, shocking in a country that had seized another without having any idea of what it wanted to do in it. London displayed no contrition about its failure to provide the guidance which Wingate sought throughout its period of office. After Ronald Graham, a Foreign Office assist Assistant Under Secretary, told him in March 1917 that no one here has any very clear idea about an Egypt policy. On several occasions, he asked him to be made acquainted with the policy of the government in regard to the future of Egypt, sought some light as to the policy which His Majesty's government intend to pursue after the war, and said, it is vitally important to me to know how far I can indicate to the Sultan what is in the government's mind. After Rushdie had sought clarification of UK intentions and Wingate had referred in a letter to Foreign Office Permanent Under Secretary Lord Harding to whatever policy the British government may eventually decide to adopt in regard to Egypt, he received no acknowledgement. He informed Harding that he had no conception of the plans and ideas of the British government and after Harding admitted that he could not enter into the large question of what our future policy in Egypt may be, pathetically stated that he was sure that when it is possible to give any sort of indication of how the cat is going to, be, is, is going to jump, you will help me if you can, so as to enable me to shape my course. The Foreign Office failed to respond to his request for some indication of the view of His Majesty's government regarding the future of Egypt of a more definite nature than I have yet received. Unsurprisingly, the WAFT account of the critical 13th of November 1918 meeting quotes Wingate as admitting he had no conception of London's plans. The spectacle of a High Commissioner pleading for guidance from a government which has no plans for a country it has taken the trouble to send him to, is, even making allowances for war and wartime preoccupations, extraordinary. From early in his posting, Wingate had drawn attention to the activities of nationalists, including the Khadiv, and had been sympathetic towards them. He had told Graham that, our Egyptian friends are all out for as complete autonomy as they can get. The Sultan hoped that Egypt would be granted full, full autonomy in due course. Believing that it was only just that the Sultan, his ministers, and the Egyptians generally should be told how they stand, he had advised Harding that there could not be a more favorable time than the present to settle once and for all the future of Egypt and warned him to expect a very frank expose of national aspirations when the war is over. In August 1918, Wingate forecast to Graham that the Sultan and his ministers were likely to open their mouths wide when the war is over, and suggested to a contemptuous foreign office that the Sultan might find courting the nationalists post-war an attractive way of bolstering his image and position. In October, he informed Harding that President Wilson's stance on self-determination had taken a strong hold on Fuad, who was all for home rule. He cautioned his government to expect a movement in this direction on the part of certain sections of this country after the war. 
Next day, in connection with the Franco-British Declaration, he told the Foreign Office that it was not unlikely that the self-determination policy may have its reper repercussions among Egyptian nationalists who will no doubt desire similar treatment for Egypt. On the 13th of November, Wingate reported that Zaglul, Abdelaziz Bey Fahmi, and Ali Pasha Shawawi of his al Umma, with whom the Sultan was in alliance, had called on him to inform him that they would be demanding representation at the peace discussions to make the case for either a much larger share in the government of Egypt than they now have, or even complete autonomy as the reward for their loyalty in the war. Wingate assured them that there was no serious likelihood that objection would be made to the wish, to the wish of these members of Hezbollah Waft, as they were thereafter known, to place their views before the authorities and the British people. He gave support for them in a letter to Harding, warning that there is going to be a very determined all-round attempt to raise the Egypt question and, if possible, get it settled once and for all. And I repeat my own conviction that the present appears to me to be a favorable time to grasp the nettle and have it seriously tackled. He reported to the Foreign Office that a committee led by Zaglul was seeking to obtain the absolute independence of Egypt and risking London's irritation, reiterated, I still think it advisable that a hearing should be given to any Egyptian politicians who wish to address themselves directly to the Foreign Office. On the 15th of November, a telegram from Curzon contained the breathtaking generalization that we have had up to now no indication of such native aspirations nor of form they are likely to take. This was a serious misrepresentation of facts since from the start of his posting, Wingate had frequently and repeatedly alerted the Foreign Office to nationalist stirrings, as noted. Only for his advice to be persistently disregarded or not taken seriously in Whitehall. On the 5th of November, after he had granted Zaglul an interview, Wingate found himself blamed by the Foreign Office for boosting nationalism. After his 13th of November reception of Zaglul and his colleagues, which was fully in line with Cromer's policy that the residents should be accessible to all classes of men, Graham said that Wingate had weakly accepted the delegation's claim to speak for Egypt. Foreign Secretary Balfour added, no useful purpose would be served if nationalist leaders were allowed to come to London and advance immoderate demands. Graham charged that Wingate should have turned them down in much firmer language than he seems to have used, and that he ought never to have received the extremist leaders. In December, Balfour claimed that they are exploiting the fact of your having received them at the residency, which was unfortunate. And in January, uh, Graham... Uh, Graham wrote that the agitators were claiming that their movement had the approval of the residency. In a minute in January, he labelled irregular Wingate's holding what he now called private interviews with the nationalists and accused him of forming an alliance with the resurgent nationalists of the Umar party, which he should have thwarted. The tide quickly turned. In March 1919, Allenby said he wished Wingate's advice had been taken that respectable Egyptians, whatever their views, should be allowed to travel when he first advocated it. The UK refusal was unfortunate. With the revolution underway on the 18th of March, Balfour was agreeing with Wingate and declaring himself now ready to discuss the grievances of Egyptian ministers even in company with persons qualified to represent the nationalist case, even in its extreme form. George V's private secretary, Lord Stamfordham, admitted to Wingate later that 
I really don't see how the government will excuse themselves for the utter vault fuss about allowing the ministers and nationalists to come to Europe. In June, Balfour admitted to Curzon that Wingate gave specific advice on a difficult problem, warning us that if his advice was not followed, trouble would ensue. Thereupon, we practically tell him that he's not the man most competent to deal with the situation thus created and that somebody else must be put in his place. He confessed that the story was not one very easy to clothe in attractive flesh and, flesh and blood. After Curzon gave him the news in July 1919 that he was to be removed of his post because of the perceived inadequacies of his performance, Wingate rightly insisted that he had repeatedly warned the government of the recrudescence of nationalism in Egypt and the probability of a determined effort by the Nationalist Party to obtain their demands on the cessation of, of hostilities. Some of the reasons given by London for Wingate's downfall were not without validity. One was Graham's analysis on the 25th of November that the root of the whole trouble was the fact that the residency and the palace were not working in as close harmony and contact as they ought to be. Another was his complaint in January 19, 1919, following Wingate's abandonment of the intelligence expertise of stores, that Zaglul and his friends should have, at least so it appears, concerted their action with the Sultan and probably Rushdie Pasha, if not others of the ministers, and then have come to see you as a deputation without your having any previous knowledge of the objects and aims of the visit. While the March 1921 Milner Commission report charged unconvincingly that Wingate's wiser counsels about the nationalist threat were not listened to, perhaps because they were not urged with sufficient insistence, the persistence with which he pressed London over matters it disfavoured was an irritant. So when the Sultan declined to act on a Foreign Office suggestion that he tell the nationalist leaders that their agitations were rendering a real disservice to Egypt, Wingate's, was Wingate's advice that Fuad's failure to comply may involve sacrifice of his own position, which, like his hint that he should be ennobled, was rejected as above his pay scale by an irritated foreign office. Allenby, sorry, Wingate was suspended in January 1919. The revolution began on the 10th of March in reaction to Chargé d'Affaires Cheatham's deportation of Zaglul, future Prime Ministers Ismail Sidki Pasha and Mohamed Mahmoud, and future WAFT Vice President Hamid Pasha al Basil to Malta. It was largely contained by the 20th. The same day, Balfour announced the posting to Cairo of General Sir Edmund Allenby, the Egyptian army commander who in the war had occupied Palestine and Syria. He was appointed as special high commissioner with full civil and military powers to restore normality. He arrived in Cairo on the 25th. At a meeting of leading citizens, he demanded a return to law and order and with breathtaking naivety said, I cannot believe that any of you will not assist me in every way. He called for responsible Egyptians to submit a statement showing what steps they considered necessary to restore tranquility and content, and announced his intention to issue passports to any respectable Egyptians who may wish to visit Europe without reference to the color of their requirements. In April, he proposed to receive an extremist deputation. Prime Minister Lloyd George cabled him his complete support. Although on the 3rd of April, nine people had been killed and 60 wounded in rioting, four days later, Allenby released Zaglul, provoking claims that he had given in to violence. Harding accused him of ignorance, even with the best intentions, 
rated him quite unfit to cope with the Egyptians and claimed that he had gone to the extremists everything that they had asked for. Whereas Wingate had, vis-a-vis -vis Whitehall, been tentative and timid, Allenby, with no diplomatic experience, saw no reason, however, why he should cause out to London in decision-making. He was unable to take advantage, he was able to take advantage of the inertia or distractions of the Foreign Office to record two major events in modern Egyptian history, the 1922 Declaration and the 1924 Ultimatum. In November, he made a declaration of British policy which he had extracted with difficulty from the government. Despite its promising stress on Egyptian autonomy under British protection, self-government and a con constitutional system managed by the Sultan, ministers and elected representatives on the 30th of November, the campaign of violence resumed. On the 7th of December, the Milner Commission of Inquiry arrived for a three-month stay. It was largely boycotted by the WAFT, the Sultan and ministers, but Zaglul and seven waftists, now accorded all facilities, met Milner in London. A Milner-Zaglul agreement followed, but supplementary negotiations were fruitless. In March 1921, the Commission's report recommended that the Protectorate be replaced by a Treaty of Alliance, awarding Egypt full internal self-government and the right to conclude international treaties. Further talks in London broke down over Britain's determination to preserve its imperial communications, its defence of uh, Egypt, its protection of foreign residents and the Sudan as inviolable reserved matters. On the 22nd of December, provoking three months of violence throughout the country, Allenby deported Zaglul to the Seychelles for refusing to give up his political activities, and with him five other waftists, including his closest allies, Mustafa Nahas, Makram, and Makram Abed. Next month, Milner having been shelved, he brusquely demanded of Curzon author authorization to send to Fuad without delay and without notification a letter composed for him astonishingly and perhaps unworthily by Prime Minister Adli Pasha Yakan and Minister of Finance Sidki, after negotiations with Minister of the Interior Abdul Khalik Sawat Pasha, with whom he admitted he was committed and compromised. It proposed that the UK, retaining the reserve matters, should unilaterally abolish the protectorate and, by treaty, recognize Egypt as an independent state. When the cabinet found its proposals unacceptable, Allenby informed Curzon that the advice he had given was his final considered opinion and would, he claimed, prove to be the basis of a lasting settlement. He insisted that not to take it would throw away all chance of a friendly Egypt in our time. In a very insulting telegram, the cabinet called him home for consultations. Arriving in London on the 10th of Feb February, Allenby delivered a 29-page dispatch to the Foreign Office in which he denied that his political reporting had been inadequate. In a famous exchange on the 20th of February, understandably impatient, he said, I have waited five weeks for a decision and I can't wait any longer. I shall tell Lady Allenby to come home. Lord George's rejoinder was, you have waited five weeks, Lord Allenby, wait five more minutes. In remarks about an ambassador inappropriate in a foreign secretary, Austin Chamberlain unforgivably misled the House of Commons by claiming that it was Allenby who had surrendered. On his 28th of February return to Cairo, however, Allenby announced that the cabinet had agreed to his demands, which resulted in the 1922 declaration to Egypt. Drawn up in London to his specification, it retained the reserve points, but terminated the protectorate, the country becoming, in a diplomatic fiction, an independent sovereign state. 
Sawat formed an administration, the Sultan became King Fuad, and Allenby had triumphed over London. In March 1923, he freed Zaglul unconditionally from Gibraltar, whither he had been moved. On the 19th of April, a new constitution based on the declaration was enacted, providing for an elected chamber of deputies and a Senate with two thirds of its membership to be nominated by the king, who thus received the lion's share of legislative power. Zaglul returned to Cairo in September. Under the first constitutional democratic elections, in January 1924, he became Prime Minister of a People's Ministry when the WAFT won 179 of the 211 seats. It was ominous that in Parliament he said that Egypt was not bound by the 1922 declaration, that for the Egyptian army to have a British commander was objectionable, and that he would continue to demand the complete independence of both Egypt and the Sudan which was an integral part of the Egyptian kingdom. In talks in London in September and October with his British counterpart, Ramsay MacDonald, who had insisted that there was no question of the UK abandoning the Sudan, Zaglul concentrated his demands on the reserve matters and was utterly unyielding and intransigent. He returned home in October on the 19th of November, Sir Lee Stack, Wingate's successor in Khartoum, and a close friend of Allenby's, was shot in a Cairo street. Zaglul rushed round to express deep regret, agreed immediately to offer a £10,000 reward for information, and urged the doctors to save Stack and the police to catch his assailants. Allenby told him that this is your doing. 36 people were arrested, and nine months later, seven were executed, and one was sentenced to penal servitude for life. Stack died next day. After his funeral on the 22nd of November, Allenby went with a heavy military escort to Zaglul's office to read him an ultimatum on which he ignored London's comments. He gave Zaglul 24 hours to comply with its nine points. Although labelling Allenby's action a vulgar expression of defiance or contempt, Chamberlain upheld it. Once more, London had backed down. On the 23rd of November, the Egyptian chamber accepted the first three demands of the ultimatum, a sincere apology, punishment for the murderers, and the banning of all popular demonstrations, but voted against an increase in the Sudan's share of Nile water, the replacement of the Egyptian units in the Sudan by the Sudan Defence Force, and the retention of the British financial and judicial advisor posts. Allenby went ahead with them nonetheless, and after protest, the Senate and the Chamber agreed, under pressure from him, to comply. Zaglul res resigned on the 24th, and he was succeeded by the pro-British moderate Ahmed Ziwa Pasha. Allenby's actions since the assassination of Stack had lost him the Foreign Office's residual trust. It queried whether our Cairo reports faithfully represent the state of affairs in Egypt. And Chamberlain offended him by sending him a deputy and minister plenipotentiary, Neville Henderson, as a crisis manager. Allenby resigned but remained at post for the next seven months. Before his departure, he softened his hard line, advising the Sudan not to implement the Nile water clause if means could be found to safeguard Egyptians' interests, and now endorsing Zaglul's proposal that the CNC of the Egyptian army should be an Egyptian. He also, however, took measures without foreign office authority to keep Zaglul out of office. Accordingly, after March elections in which the WAFT won most of the seats and Zaglul was elected president of the chamber, Fouad, known for his implacable hostility to parliamentary government, refused an offer from Ziwa to resign, granted an immediate dissolution and suspended the constitution. 
Allenby gave Ziwa the task of diluting Egypt, Egypt's democracy in order to crush the waft, as in April, to Allenby's satisfaction, the king prepared to rule without a parliament through his own Hizb al-Itihad. <coughs> Allenby, the vanquisher of Zaglul, departed on the 14th of June, 1925. He had, however, by no means destroyed the waft, which remained the governing party, struggling with Fuad and Farouk for most of the period until 1952. His successor, the arch-imperialist Lloyd, considered something of a danger to Egypt, was removed by Chamberlain. He was the second of the residents discussed to be removed while on home leave. The third was Sir Percy Lorraine, who, starved of guidance, inquired if it was a great offence for an agent to ask what the principal wants done. After being accused of being too involved in Egypt's inter-party struggles and internal affairs, he, Lorraine was demoted and posted to Ankara from Cairo, the proconsular graveyard. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter, and, and obviously through you, thanks to Richard Long, for a, I found a rather gripping narrative. I didn't want to interrupt it. Uh, now, um, it, it has, though, meant we've only got uh, ten minutes or so, probably, for comments or questions. So who wants to uh, go first? I mean, obviously, we have uh, Professor Whidden here, uh, so I suppose the pressure's on you, rather. The pressure's on him. <laughs> Uh, I'm only responsible for what's happened since September 2018. <laughs> Anyone want to? Uh, yes, you, you had your hand up first, and then the lady. Sir. Uh, Professor Wedden, please. Um, thank you. You mentioned in your talk that uh, the British government was caring for the Falahin in Egypt. How sincere was that? Did they want them to take part in... Uh, in uh, parliamentary uh, uh, representation or just to be helped with the work? I, I was just going to suggest, may we take two or three questions together, because then I think that'll give an opportunity for more people to speak, and then uh, Professor Whitten can think up the replies. Uh, the lady at the back first, and then the gentleman in the blue. Um, thank you very much for um, both uh, presentations. My question is really an extension of the first question, but in a very much more general sense that um, I found is always very difficult to measure as an academic. Um, uh, is there any way, a scientific or social scientific way to measure the degree of independence of a movement like nationalism from the for example, British, what the British policy is, from the point of view of a person who's studying it now, the past, how, how can we measure it? Is it just uh, uh, archival documents that uh, you very kindly shared with us, or are there other things? Is it, I mean, maybe it's not possible 100%. How shall we do it? Thank you. Let's just have a third uh, question, and then uh, we'll ask... It, is, it is for you, Mr. Ambassador. Oh, really? I note that you were smiling when there was nothing coming back from London. <laughs> <laughs> repeated questions, so... How unlike our own. <laughs> um, Professor Whitten. Um, yeah, on the, on the Falahin. So I described it as a, a colonial doctrine, and basically this idea that the, the British were guardians of the Falahin was based on, on the idea that you know, the Egyptian elite could not be given um, political responsibility for the population because that would just lead to misrule. So that's the initial uh, justification for the British occupation. So, but it was sincere in the sense that many British officials regarded their work as for the benefit of the majority of the population, but they did see that um, uh, as you know, part of this evolutionary process over a long period of time, uh, an illiterate and uneducated population, the, the, which is basically what they meant by the Falahin. And there's also this opposition between the indigenous Egyptians and then the sort of more uh, Ottoman kind of ruling class, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, I can answer yes, they were sincere, but basically uh, it was used as a justification for depriving the Egyptians of self-government. Yeah, that, that's what it is, main purpose of that doctrine. 
Um, secondly, I didn't quite follow it. Did you want to respond to that? Is it about um, your, your question again? Just say, can you summarize it in a sentence? Have you got a comment on that? Well, what I tried to show was there were, you know, there was liberal imperialists and there were conservative imperialists. And the liberal imperialists bought into this idea, I mean, which had evolved over a, a period of time, that um, colonized people could, you know, uh, attain self-government and self-rule. Conservative imperialists like Lord Lloyd did not believe that. And so there's a strong racial content, for instance, but, you know, it's also civilizational. Um, with the belief amongst conservative imperialists that the British really were the only group capable of governing these societies, which then yeah. goes back to that kind of evolutionary view of civilizational progress. So that's kind of how I see it, is that at that moment in history, some, you know, there, there, were, there were Britons who believed that, that the Egyptians were capable of self-government, others didn't. So you had a kind of a political conflict. It doesn't line up liberal, conservative, in terms of conservative party, liberal party, but it's quite specific about colonial policy. Let's take a few more uh, questions from the floor. Dr. Magdim. Uh, does the lack of British policy or a strategy about Egypt uh, ring a bell for us about the lack of the policy or strategy post-Brexit or pre-Brexit? Um, let's, take, let's take one or two other. Uh, <laughs> was that a question or a comment? Uh, a gentleman there in the black uh, top. It's a, question. it's a question, of course. You were talking about the uh, uh, foreign occupation of a country like Egypt uh, w without the occupier knowing what to do with it later. True. Uh, does it ring a bell or is there some kind of parallel to modern times, Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever? Or, or is there no, no, uh, no comparison at all? Any other uh, from the floor? The lady here hasn't spoken before. Just um, a comment. I just found it very, very, very difficult to find documents because I was researching uh, through the archive uh, about Sanafir and uh, Tirana, and I found it ever so difficult, the communication between the foreign office and the Egyptian, uh, I mean the British authority in Egypt. Exactly the same like we face today. Is that something inside the foreign office uh, missing or just they denying the facts? Uh, um, just to say, actually, because it, it relates to a question I'm often asked, um, some people think that in that building we have piles of papers uh, which we are uh, full of awkward secrets. Uh, the truth is that all official British papers are in the National Archive. And that's that's the only place they are. But the communication is if if they were if they were retained, they'll be in the National Archive. If they exist, they'll be in the National Archive. <laughs> I promise you. I promise. Good. Well, then then they don't exist. I don't have them. Honest. Uh, let's take some more. Lady there. Lady there. In the, uh, that's it. Wilson's comment on self-determination has been mentioned in passing. How far do you think that has overstepped its usage in the last hundred years or so? And how far does it apply really in the question of local determination versus nationalist determination? Let's take a couple more comments, and then maybe Professor Wooden will have a comment on that. Was it you who used it, or was it Richard? It was Richard. Okay. Well, you still might have a comment. But anyway, one or two more people who might want to say something. Sorry, lady there. Uh, uh, 
Right. Uh, my question is for Professor Wooden. First of all, thank you very much right. for the paper. Um, and thank you for bringing in a perspective that is often lost, um, the perspective from um, what was going on in Britain at the time, the change in government, especially the change from liberal to conservative government and how that impacted policy in Egypt. Um, so you use the term effendis, which we can find in the Arabic documents a lot. I don't find it very often in the Foreign Office papers. I always <coughs> find that the term <coughs> pashas, beshas, beshawet, is used as a blanket term to refer to all of those belonging to the educated class as opposed to the 90% or alleged 90%, uh, other 90% of the population, the fellahi. So um, you refer to Morris Amos's memo, memorandum, where he actually questions that distinction and says, um, actually, we have two groups within the educated class. So we have those that are represented by Zaghloul, the um, younger members of the professions, the students, the Azharites, and then we have those that uh, we may say are represented by Adli Yakan, and these represent the older members of the profession. Um, and of course, you know, the aristocracy in a sense, right? So you have the educa educated aristoc aristocrats, and then you have the other educated younger members of the professions, um, like Zaghloul, who are themselves have kind of um, fallahi, fallahin or uh, rural roots, um, the gentrified educated class, if you will. So, um, of course, you know, to me, the, the latter are, are the Effendis and, and the former are the Pajas, but I don't find that distinction in the Foreign Office uh, papers. Um, so when you make that distinction, is that actually a reflection of what you have read or um, is that something that you yourself have brought into um, your reading of events? First one. So it was kind of hard to follow exactly by going with what I think you're asking. So in the Foreign Office papers, Effendi is definitely a category that they, they regard. Like that's a specific category and that represents the younger professionals, right, coming out of the more modern schools. There is the Pashas or the Bashawad. And so, the, and so you can sort of see those distinctions as an aristocratic party, some in the British can work with when they talk about the Pashas and the Effendis. And so Zagul, by this point, is a Pasha. He sort of comes from an older generation, but the people around him are largely Effendi. So that's why I don't think it's really necessarily helpful to use these kind of categories like Pasha, Effendi, Ifala, et cetera. Because, so the, you know, for me, uh, Amos's, uh, Morris Amos's analysis kind of makes more sense because basically he's, what he's saying is that, again, to a large degree, if we want to understand the Revolutionary Party, they are, tend to be younger. But we can't say that they're all um, people f with a modern education, because many of them are also, as you say, as a right or whatever. So um, is that kind of answering your question? I'm not, I don't think I'm inventing these categories. I pretty much see them there. And uh, so it goes back, really, to the turn of the century, where the Effendi, the, Lord Cromer, you can read his reports, and he talks about the educated Egyptian, and really he's talking about the educated fala, right? There's that idea that if you're of Egyptian origin, you're a fala. They're untrustworthy because it's all, you know, it's just very racist, really, in the sense that this is a group of people who can't, aren't really capable of adopting modern <laughs> political ideologies. So it's a, almost a, like a, a distorted group, and very untrustworthy, um, and so that's why that, that label, Effendi, is something that they apply to the Revolutionary Party led by Zagul. And so they did very much see, therefore, that's why I use this. And they use the concept of Girondist and Jacobin as well. They use the example of the French Revolution. So they see Zagul as someone who's gone from a sort of Girondist position, moderate, to a Jacobin, to a revolutionary one. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. I'm looking to Noel to ask, are we, are we all right for time, or is there time for one more round of... Time for one more. One more, one more round, then, of two or three. So in the yellow time. Oh, yes, quite, quite, sorry, yes. Questions, you have as well. Carry on. Uh, I'm really surprised that there is like a schism or uh, the, uh, there is a division between the foreign office and the ambassador in Egypt, <laughs> which I can't understand. My question is, what is the basis of this schism? Is it ignorance or just strategic policy? And does this carry on with you as with the other? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, I was going to say to, 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 to everyone who has tried to tempt me into talking about current <laughs> affairs, all I would say is I've only been ambassador in Cairo for six months, and I have every intention of doing about three or four years. <laughs> so purely in the interest of the preservation of my career, 
um, I, I, I don't want to be tempted by some of those down the road. But may I just say, no, you've asked a question which I can uh, say something about, which is that um, uh, it's an in, I, I would say, I mean, I, my colleagues will have views about this, it, there's an intrinsic tension, and always is, in every country and at all times, between the views of the man or woman on the spot and headquarters. It's just essential. And sometimes that tension can be creative, sometimes le less so. But th there's a reason for it, is that if you are an ambassador, as I've been several times in a country, you, that's the, your whole life. You, you devote all your energy into that country. But if you are sitting in London, which I've also done, you're looking at the whole world. So it's a question, it's about competing tensions and priorities. And I think that's at the heart of what I would describe as an, in, as an intrinsic tension, uh, which I don't think we should be surprised at. I think the yeah, text think, you read yeah. said, oh, this is horrifying and surprising. Actually, it's, it's completely normal. Uh, and I don't <laughs> think uh, uh, surprising at all. So that's my comment. Um, we had a question about uh, with the Wilson uh, quote, presumably President Wilson you were talking about, uh, who was referred to. Did you have a comment on that? Well, you could say that you know, the waft, Zaglu, was uh, Wilsonian, right? He was living in that Wilsonian moment, and so the Egyptians <laughs> wanted complete independence. Um, and, but the British, what I was trying to say in terms of we have to sort of view the British through their own prism and their concept of a kind of a British legal geography, that's why I use that term. It, they didn't really buy into that, that the, the Wilsonian idea. So they still viewed colonized people as having to somehow come within, within the framework of empire. I'm not certain that answers your right. question. But. Th thank you for that. Now, now, we will take one positively final round of people. Uh, Professor Khalid Fahmi. I didn't mean my question to be a, a comment to, on your comment, but in a sense it will be. Because I, I was wondering if, if any of the panelists can tell us more about who else in London, apart from the Foreign Office, can have a say in or did have a say back then. Uh, I mean, would the India Office be involved or the Colonial Office or the War Office in shaping policy towards Egypt? And what would the relationship be? Um, uh, you know, just to complicate the picture a bit sure. further. Absolutely. I'm sure Professor Whitman will have a comment about that. Let's just take, the, there was some right at the back there being pointed to there. Sir, yeah. In the dark. A friend of yours is pointing at you all the time. <laughs> so yeah. I think they want to, I'll say Thank something. Thank you. So we've, we've basically had two accounts. Um, this papers take the same line and, and it's just been elaborated on by you. Uh, his Excellency the Ambassador, and even there are various conflicts mm -hmm. within the making of foreign policy about Egypt. But uh, 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 among our presence here is Eugene Rogan, for example, who sort of uh, treated a similar period and talked about decision overload. That is to say that the complex time of 1919, 1924, and all that was going on, whether the Russian Revolution, uh, the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, and on and on it goes. And yet in these papers, we, we don't get any sense of decision overload. Egypt is sort of factored out of the context in which decisions are being made about uh, UK foreign policy at the time. So I'm wondering if you could speculate about how much decision overload is a problem in focusing upon Egypt by the decision makers who Wingate is trying to appeal to and who do not respond to him. Uh, it did, was there anyone else who's dying? The, the, one, right. You, sir, because you've not spoken, and then the last word, because he wants another word, to the man in the blue jersey. How much was the policy towards Europe, which you dis uh, towards Egypt, which you <laughs> described, <laughs> Freudian slip? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, was part of a global vision on the whole post-Ottoman settlement, the installation of the Hashemites, you know, Abdullah and Faisal in Iraq and, uh, you know, Jordan. How much was that a part of a total yep. vision or were they tended to look at individually? Yeah, very good. And so, very, very, two words. It's actually, <laughs> the, the fact it's always divide and rule and normally you divide Egypt between Christians and minorities and whatever against the Muslims. In 1919, based on all what I heard now, that was not easy to do. So therefore, they went into classing as you were describing. If this is true, what I'm saying, that they didn't because there was a kind of a unity in the streets between Muslims and Christians. The strategy diverted from the natural way of minorities' right and we defend them is to fallahin or whatever. First one. 
Okay, so, yeah, to respond to this idea of other um, comment on the uh, government vision. bodies, like I think the Colonial Office wasn't really involved much in this, um, but the War Office was. So I think that the way to look at this, and this puts it in a larger context, this goes to this question of there's other, other rivalries and other departments. And so the War Office, I think, is the key one because the, you know, the First World War in the Middle East was won on the Egyptian front. Um, you, know, you have a, uh, an army of occupation in um, you know, greater Syria, a British army there. So the, the War Office all, all of a sudden realizes that, that, that Egypt is a key post that needs to be held on to. And between 1919 and 1924, the, um, uh, the Air Force is building new bases just on the perimeter of Cairo. So when it comes right down to the nitty gritty in terms of the cabinet making decisions, I think it's the War Office that kind of steps in and says, well, we really don't want want absolute independence because we need to know that Cairo is yeah. secure. So, and that fits into this as some other the other questions pointed to a kind of larger perspective that the you know the British Empire wasn't simply it wasn't simply Egypt, but it was holding on the, to the empire. So they're here they're thinking about India, you know, and the Suez Canal, etc. Also, and you can think of the context I mentioned earlier. There's Ireland uh, as well, and so again to make concessions to nationalists. Um, in, in Egypt, then when you're, go, when you're confronting a kind of rebellion in Ireland at the same time, that, that's also a concern, I think. Did you want to say something? Okay. Peter had a, had a comment. I just had a comment on the, the question about was there a vision to what the British were trying to do uh, after, the, uh, after the First World War? And it's quite coincidental, really. I came across in the archives a 15-page Foreign Office memorandum intriguingly dated about the 8th of November 1918, that is to say before the armistice, uh, which sets out the, the considerations for what to do in the whole of the Middle East and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it, de it details you know, what treaties are we bound by, what objectives do we have, what is the impact of President Wilson's uh, uh, self-determination policy. I don't have the reference with me, but I'd be glad to take a, a note of anyone who would like me to follow up on it. But it, was, it is a remarkable uh, vision for uh, the next 20 years after 90. I think we should close that session now. So can I thank you all very much indeed for your participation. Can I particularly thank Professor Whitten for a brilliant oh, uh, talk. Uh, can I thank you, Peter, for reading out, uh, and please pass our thanks to Richard Long for an extremely stimulating and, I thought, uh, riveting account.